So the talk that uh, Mark had planned on giving that I will give you is going to focus on his work, even though he's done a lot of research in, in the field of schizophrenia. He's also, in the past 10 years, uh, really begun to work a lot in the field of bipolar disorder. And uh, I'll present to you some of the studies that have been conducted in that in the cross-species research into uh, bipolar disorder. As an outline, of course, we'll provide the introduction to bipolar disorder and why the interest. Uh, I'll describe how Mark was instrumental in creating uh, the Human Behavioral Pattern Monitor as a way to distinguish from the schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, acutely ill uh, subjects. Talk about uh, dopamine transporter deficient mice, whether they're uh, adequate as a model for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And um, we'll also briefly touch on translating human tests for risky behavior. And we'll talk about the, um, the way we've worked to develop a cross-species translational test uh, of a continuous performance task in order to model some of the cognitive deficits associated with bipolar disorder. The translational theme is quite strong throughout this, and, and, one, of the, and one of the key elements of this translational theme I'll, I'll go through um, as we go. Now, in 2011, we published uh, together to describe, obviously, some of the key symptomatology of uh, bipolar disorder. It was relatively easy to take the lists from the DSM-4, but if we were talking about translation, it's kind of, it's not the easiest to simply model uh, a group decreased sleep, appearance, or psychosis, or delusions in animals. Although certainly psychomotor activation can be modeled. Uh, what didn't appear in the DSM-4 is the neurocognitive deficits that are also associated with bipolar disorder, such as vigilance deficit and uh, risk-taking behavior, each of which I'll touch on today. I'll also mention uh, deficits in inhibitory control. These kind of measurements are actually more amenable to, to be able to do the cross-species translation. And I'll provide uh, examples of that throughout this talk. Now, just to uh, introduce bipolar disorder, it's a, it's a rather unique disorder uh, in the field in the sense that the same sufferer um, cycles from episodes of mania to depression and back again. Um, these, two, these two behaviors are rather extreme, and it's been difficult to pinpoint what are the underlying mechanisms of bipolar disorder. One of the reasons, uh, that has been one of the reasons why all treatments to date that are being used for people with bipolar disorder have been discovered serendipitously. None of them have been developed with bipolar disorder in mind. We have lithium and valproate as, um, that are used as antimanic or maintenance therapies. We also have antipsychotics, which were obviously originally developed for schizophrenia. And there's also um, anticonvulsants being used. None of the treatments, however, are effective for uh, cognitive dysfunction. And realistically speaking, we need better translational models for bipolar disorder specifically so as to generate uh, better knowledge of the underlying neur neural mechanisms, as well as to develop treatments targeted at those mechanisms. Now, uh, cross-species studies in bipolar disorder have focused on a predominance of using the amphetamine-induced hyperactivity model for bipolar disorder, where you give a rodent amphetamine, they suddenly become hyperactive. Well, they're hyperactive, so they must have bipolar disorder. Now, unfortunately, this not, nothing as simple as that. These same model is also used to identify um, treatments for schizophrenia, for drugs ab uh, drug abuse, tardive dyskinesia, Tourette syndrome. Um, and now, obviously, antipsychotics are used for many of these disorders as well, so amphetamine-induced hyperactivity is not going to be selective to bipolar disorder. And there's also many other drugs that can actually increase activity in animals. Does that mean they're all necessarily models for bipolar disorder, such as PCP, scopolamine? I mean, even caffeine increases activity in animals. Does that mean it's a viable model for bipolar disorder? I'm guessing with your time spent in the pavilion, uh, it's hopefully that's not the case. Uh, Obviously, the, um, when it comes to doing cross-species translational research, there are certain uh, behaviors we can investigate beyond hyperactivity, and one of these is pre-pulse inhibition, uh, for, um, which uh, pre-pulse inhibition deficits are also seen in patients with schizophrenia and across many other disorders. I'll touch on e each of these topics as we go along. Ideally, for developing a treatment and for understanding a mechanism, I mean, what the pharmaceutical industry would love to do would be to go from the construct straight into proof of efficacy uh, trials in patients in phase three. Obviously, it's not that simple. 
what we have to do is we have to go through an entire drug discovery mechanism. We go through proof of mechanism, positive evidence in rodents and non-human primates, and then through into humans and all the way through. And this takes quite some time, as uh, Mark had published in TIPS in 2012. One of the things he highlighted, of course, was the fact that, um, that e these arrows are bi-directional, and they're bi-directional for a reason. The evidence that we generate in humans and that we, uh, how we understand the disorder is the only way that's going to inform us on how to model the disorder in the first place. If we stopped in schizophrenia and um, only investigating hallucinations, there's nothing we could necessarily have done on the animal side. It's having a more complete understanding of the disorder that can inform the animal literature. But that's not to say the animal world can't inform the human world. We want that to happen in terms of developing treatments, but we also want that to happen in terms of generating better measurements for which to understand the neural mechanisms underlying the disorder. And so this bi-directional aspect is, is certainly an important theme that will be touched on throughout this talk. Um, and in fact, in his paper, he highlighted that the, these two parts of where the animal and the human meet that's really where the translational bottleneck is for developing almost every, farm, uh, every agent from animals to humans. There's the predominance of failure at this bridge. And by uh, building a better bridge, we can more, they will have an increased likelihood of building better and more selective and approved treatments in the long term. Now, startle and prepulse inhibition is, is, is a, a primary example of some of the work that Mark has done in the past, and it's perhaps some of the work that he's better known for. Um, in humans, startle is measured using an EMG electrode just attached to the, near, uh, the muscle in the eye, and they're given loud noises, that, electro, that magnetic pulse. And in response to a loud pulse of 110 decibels, you get a startle response in this human subject. If you proceed that with a prepulse, the response is somewhat inhibited, and that gives you your measure of prepulse inhibition. Obviously, we can do the exact same kind of work in animals, and that's primarily where most of Mark's high-cited publications come from. So in rodents at rest, when you measure, when you provide a startled response, you get this whole body contraction, which we can measure using an accelerometer puck in a, in a paradigm. And we can get, generate the same kind of measure where you get a pre-pulse and you get a reduced effect when you have the pre-pulse and pulse. And that's most of Mark's history. Just as I give you a brief example of how that's been used in the past in terms of uh, manic bipolar disorder, certainly we can measure that manic bipolar disorder sufferers have deficits in prepulse inhibition. It was first published back in 2001. What's interesting is that, and um, what is almost ubiquitous, is that there are many animal models out there which show reduced PPI, and they're commonly used to try and identify ways to develop better treatments. The dopamine transporter knockout mouse is one such animal that has lower PPI in comparison to the wild type litermates. As you can see here, um, as the as the, as the pre-pulse increases from four to 16 above background, you get larger levels of PPI, but these knockout animals shown here have a lower level, which still increases with increased pre-pulse in intensity, but is still deficient compared to their wild types. And what's interesting is that we can show that these uh, effects are attenuated by treatment with antipsychotics such as clozapine and catiapine. And you know, that's one way that we can do cross-species translational research and modeling for uh, bipolar disorder. Another example of a commonly used test in uh, the animal world, though, is measuring activity. I mentioned, um, I mentioned amphetamine induced hyperactivity as a common model. But when you take these same dopamine transporter knockout mice and you just put them in a, an open field, you can measure their x, y coordinates. And what you find is that the dopamine transporter knockout mice have this kind of higher activity levels driven specifically by a kind of racetrack pattern where they're running around the outside. Now we get measurements of distance, we can generate a measure of spatial D, I'll get to that in a moment, but we can you know, begin to quantify the kind of activity that the animals are showing. And it's interesting that if we give the animals, obviously, uh, yeah, D2 antagonists like Raclopride, uh, uh, you can uh, attenuate some of that, uh, those changes as well. So in a very simplistic way, we can do some of this uh, behavioral pharmacology. What I'd like to take, you f take this further forward, though, and show you the idea that Mark uh, and Bill Perry had to take it further on and make it relevant to the studies that are being conducted in humans. 
So build, basically building a better trap, building a better bridge between animal and humans. Uh, in a discussion with Bill Perry, who's um, head of the neuropsychiatric unit in, in uh, the medical center in Hillcrest at UCSD, uh, Bill mentioned the difficulty of trying to distinguish between uh, patients with schizophrenia uh, that are acutely ill and patients that have bipolar disorder that are acutely ill. They actually, uh, a lot of the characteristics are very similar. Well, Mark mentioned that, uh, well, actually, we have the we have similar findings where we can generate hyperactivity in animals, as I mentioned, using amphetamine, PCP, scopolamine, and everything looks the same if you're only measuring one particular thing. But we generated a, he generated a task, which are the behavioral pattern monitor, which allows him to measure a multitude of variables, and using that, you can actually parse them out. So thought, why not create a version in humans? It's what we found was, though, that the manic and the schizophrenia patients both showed PPI deficits, but it didn't separate them out. The bipolar patients are, being, are more commonly described as motorically hyperactive. So we were hoping to, maybe we could use this as a way to separate the two of them. And so although we've, uh, we've used this open field in rodents, we, we've, since so much work has been done in rodents, we can actually separate out stimulants. And so developing a human open field would give us a better methodology for evaluating animal models. So here's an example of the rat behavioral monitor. Uh, as I said, Mark is better known for his work with PPI, but believe it or not, these are the boxes that he built in his garage in 1978 that we still use today. Um, it's an opportunity for a rodent to explore a, a chamber. There are hole pokes available so we can measure specific exploration. There's also rearing panels, and there are a multitude of measures, as I mentioned. Here's a more updated mouse version. Um, here's the, the dimensions, There's, but you can see them in any of the publications that we have. Again, a mouse exploring, uh, specifically exploring. We can uh, separate out the chamber into nine different regions, and using these regions, using this measure of XY coordinates, we can generate all of these different measures that mostly fall into three different types of categories. Three factors. Now we've done a factor analysis in rats and in mice, and uh, we'll be moving into it in humans as I'll get to, but ultimately the, these three domains tend to uh, separate out in terms of hyperactivity, specific exploration like hole poking and rearing, and locomotor patterns, an example of which is spatial D. Now in terms of spatial D, a very low spatial D means that the animal is moving very one-dimensionally through space in straight lines. A very high spatial D, it's more of a meandering type behavior. Now, if you, the best way I've heard it characterized was the person that came up with this measure, Martin Paulus, and he said, imagine two, you meet two people going through a forest. The first person you meet is trying to get to the other side. The other person is looking for his watch. The two of them might be just as active as one another, they might move about just as, one, as much as one another, but the behavior that they're going to exhibit is fundamentally different. If you only measure the activity level, you, for, you lose part of the information. Spatial D is one measure that gives you that extra piece of information. Here's an example of how we can uh, obviously measure the XY coordinates of uh, rats treated with different, tr different drugs. Here's saline moving around the, the chamber. When we give encyclidine, however, you see a lot of this meandering-like behavior, but you certainly see a lot more behavior. Um, a lot more activity. Amphetamine and MDMA are somewhat similar, and uh, these are all studies published uh, in the past. Now, when we look at this and we break it down by these factors, what we can find is that despite the fact that all of these drugs ultimately increase activity levels, their effects on specific exploration or the structure of behavior, that is the pattern or the spatial D, uh, whether it be entropy H, the structure different, differs. So we can use this behavioral pattern monitor to separate out effects um, that we see if we only, that we m would miss out on if we only measured activity levels. And so, as I said, Mark and Bill talked about this and said, well, if patients with, schiz with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are similar, why don't we just do something more naturalistic and increase the number of measures? So we created a human version of the behavioral pattern monitor. When we had to create a human version, they wouldn't fit in the chambers. So instead, we went into the clinic where the subjects would actually be housed for three days at a time if they were coming in with a, an acute episode. And we generated this human behavioral pattern monitor. As an example of the behavioral pattern monitor, here we have it here. Here is the room in our um, psychiatry ward that is built specifically for this. 
We have a desk, we have uh, objects scattered around, you can see them here, and we can measure their x, y coordinates by using a camera embedded in a, um, an, event, an event above the ceiling. Now what's key here is that there's no desk. That obviously makes it much more likely that the subjects are going to explore the room. We give the subjects the exact same instructions that we give our rodents. Uh, if you just wait here, we'll be back momentarily. And eventually we do come back. Obviously, they're not given any instructions beyond that. We're measuring their basic preference for exploring, whether they wish to explore a novel environment or not. And we're doing it the same in animals and in humans. Here's an example um, of uh, an XY pattern generated from subjects exploring the room. Here's the room. Here's a normal control. Here's a patient with bipolar disorder mania. A little bit more active. I'll get to some of the finer details in a moment. Here's a patient with schizophrenia, somewhat different. Now these are representative samples, but since we have a quantitative analysis of their behavior, we can obviously take these together, look at mean differences, and do, unlike in uh, some of the um, observer rating scales, we can do more, um, more uh, systematic analysis of the data. And here's an example where we looked at the distance traveled in, in the subjects when they were put into the room over a 15-minute period. Now, we broke it down into the three uh, five-minute time bins, and what you find is that the healthy subjects, the um, non-psychotic subjects, certainly are active initially, and they become less active over time. Of course, what you would expect in bipolar disorder mania, they're definitely more active. And again, they become less active over time in comparison. Patients with schizophrenia, however, don't actually become less active over time. In fact, they show a little bit less activity, but become a little more active over time. And in a, a follow-up analysis, what you find is this effect is stronger in patients with schizophrenia that are paranoid. So they tend to stay in the room, stay in one location. As time progresses, they start to explore. So we, see, so we begin to see a, a different pattern of exploration in acutely ill patients just looking at this activity measure. But we go beyond that, of course. I mentioned um, in terms of increased exploration. Um, when we talk about increased exploration, we can talk about specific exploration, and that is, I mentioned the objects scattered about the room. Again, this separates out the three different groups where the non-comparison subjects um, show, interact with maybe six or seven objects in their 15-minute time period. The bipolar patients, however, interact with a lot of the objects. Actually, based upon their behavior, we had to come up with a whole load of novel sets of measurements that we didn't think we would have to. Now, the, the person that's rating these people, they're, they're blind to their diagnosis while they're being rated. However, it's pretty obvious that when one of the subjects pick, we have a slinky, just because we thought it would be interesting. What we didn't expect was that the subjects would pick it up and use it as a scarf. Um, but if they did, we knew that they were a bipolar manic patient. They're the only ones that ever did. Um, there's drawers in some of, the, some of the cabinets that you saw. Now, if you're in a room and you're you know, you're expecting someone back any second, would you be going through the drawers? I mean, most control sub, well, actually no control subjects went through the drawers. But 50% of the bipolar manic patients went through every single drawer. Don't know what they were looking for, but it's something we're using in future studies. But you can see in the patients with schizophrenia, again, it separates them out, where the bipolar manic patients have this drive for interacting with objects in their environment that you don't see in the patients with schizophrenia. And finally, this measure, uh, spatial D, where the subjects are moving from one location to another in a straight line. You see that bipolar patients have a lower spatial D compared to that of healthy subjects. And patients with schizophrenia also have a lower spatial D. So even though they're not necessarily more active, they show a similar pattern of movement through space that's different to that of the healthy comparison subjects. So these key findings, this hyperactivity of the bipolar manic subjects, the increased drive to interact with objects, specific exploration, lower spatial D, gives us a, a signature pattern of abnormal behavior that occurs in mania that we do not necessarily see in schizophrenia. In fact, as we've tested more and more, uh, sub, more, and more clinical populations, this is a unique profile to bipolar disorder mania. Here's an ex um, one of the interesting things, of course, is that we can look at heat maps of activities in the, in the chamber. You can look at x, y coordinates, but what you see is the non-comparison subjects tend to spend most of the time by the desk, obviously waiting for people to come back. Bipolar patients 
obviously are moving around more diffusely, but they're spending more time around the object. So it confirms those kind of findings. Um, so their interest is, is primarily to be near where the objects are. And the moderate activity levels in the schizophrenia patients uh, are more reflective of that, what we see in the, the healthy comparison subjects. So we've got this signature pattern of how uh, uh, these subjects are willing to or wanting to explore a room. It's not as if we ask them to do it, it's just their internal drive. And the question is, how do we begin to then try to recreate that or understand the mechanisms underlying that drive? Now, we've, I mentioned the dopamine transporter knockout mice before, and one of the reasons I mention it is because the dopamine transporter has been linked to bipolar mania for a long time. In, in genetic studies, we see associations of polymorphism of the, the dopamine transporter to, um, to that of bipolar patients. And actually, some of the suggestions is that that polymorphism reduces cell surface expression of the dopamine transporter, so making it less functional. Now, that would make sense, and in the several studies have identified a higher dopaminergic tone in patients with bipolar disorder. If you have less dopamine transporter, as you can see here, the dopamine transporter acts to reuptake dopamine into the, in, into the neuron, whereas if it, there's less dopamine transporter, obviously there's going to be more dopamine in the synaptic cleft, activating all of these postsynaptic receptors. If you have less dopamine transporter, there's a hyperdopaminergic tone. So on the basis of this, we decided to investigate whether, you know, if we reduce the, the dopamine or the, reduce the dop level of dopamine transporters, are we going to recreate this behavioral mania profile? And so we can do it pharmacologically using amphetamine or GBR, or we can do it genetically. Now, I mentioned the dopamine transporter knockout mice. We tend not, we haven't used that in all of the future studies that I will show you because, well, for one, no subject is a complete knockout for the dopamine transporter. Uh, and two, uh, these animals are, tend to be a lot smaller than their wild type litter mates. There's a, a great deal of uh, compensatory changes. And so we wanted to get hyperdopaminergic tone, but in a robust animal. And so we used a genetic mutant that had a reduced expression of the dopamine transporter, um, thereafter referred to as the knockdown mouse or the KDs. So we hypothesized that by reducing dopamine transporter function, we could recreate this behavioral pattern uh, that we see in patients with bipolar mania. So obviously we went back to the mouse behavioral pattern monitor. And when we treated animals, uh, when we looked at our knockdown animals compared to our wild types, we found that they were more active. When we treated animals with GBR, the selective dopamine transporter inhibitor, again, we found increased activity. When we looked at hole poking, our measure of specific exploration, again, our animals are more active. Uh, the, the knockdowns, hole poke significantly more. And the, wild, and the animals treated with GBR, again, whole poke significantly more than the vehicle treated animals. And when it comes to spatial D, again, you see a lower spatial D compared in the knockdowns compared to the wild types, but, and the same is true for the animals treated with GBR 12909. One of the things I have to point out that I'm sure you're all wondering about and would like to ask later on is that, but yeah, the baseline levels are different in a vehicle versus, the, well, these are actually two different background strains. The knockdowns are in a 129 background, the uh, GBR was treated to C57 mice. Now, what I can tell you is that that's, that makes us all the more promising the fact that we're seeing the same effect in two different strains. We've since followed this up, and even when knockdown are on a, a C57 strain, we see the same behavioral profile and we see more uh, comparable levels of activity with vehicle-treated C57 mice. So if we reduce the dopamine transporter function using either genetic or pharmacological manipulation, we recreate this pattern in, uh, of effects in, that we see in bipolar mania. What's interesting is that in this, I haven't got the data here, but when we showed it in, when we did amphetamine, this commonly used uh, a model for uh, bipolar disorder mania, we tried to recreate the pattern and we did see increased activity as you might expect. We saw a lower level, a lower spatial D in our mice as well. But one of the interesting things is we actually saw a lower level of specific exploration. So this key thing that we see in bipolar manic patients and then picking up the slinky and using it as a, as a scarf, I mean, we actually have a mask there that they tend to wear as well. I, I, um, we don't see that recreated in mice treated with amphetamine. Not that we give them a slinky, but we don't see this increased level of specific exploration in terms of hole poking. And in fact, we've since recreated this finding in a lower data, or only in 18 subjects so far, 
one of our, the grant that we have just now was to test subjects with amphetamine, give healthy humans amphetamine. And what we found is that, again, we don't see this increase in specific exploration in humans given amphetamine. So even though amphetamine is a dopamine transporter blocker, it's actually more selective to the norepinephrine transporter, and it's that combination that might be masking or not recreating the perfect effect. So it seems to be that it's a selective reduction in dopamine transporter function that's key to reproducing this behavioral phenotype that we see in bipolar manic patients, that's selective to manic patients, not patients with schizophrenia. Just to give you a more uh, you know, vibrant viewpoint of this. When you look at the healthy subjects, you've seen this before, and the bipolar disorder patients, well, here's our wild-type mice, and here's our dopamine transporter knockdown mice. Even qualitatively, qualitatively, they look very similar. But importantly, it's the quantitative assessment of their behavior that provides the key uh, uh, links between the two. Now, obviously, one of the things that we find in bipolar, uh, with bipolar disorder, I mentioned it's a, it's a its key characteristic is not simply that the patients are manic all of the time. Um, there are periods of what we refer to as euthymia. The subjects, when they become, uh, when they're either treated or for a prolonged period of time, it's they're in a euthymic state where they still show some hyperactivity uh, or they still show some symptoms, but reduced symptoms. So what we find is that the... Um, when they're having a reduced symptoms, we, we can also test whether that's seen in the human behavioral pattern monitor as well. And when they have lower levels of symptoms, can we, can we see that in our animal model as well? Can we find that our animals, when they're given certain treatments such as valproate, can that attenuate the bipolar mania uh, behavior? And we can also test them in other um, aspects that go beyond just this hyperactivity. Now, to give you an example of what I was referring to in terms of our euthymic subjects, when they come in, they're nowhere near as uh, hyperactive as our, uh, our healthy controls, and nowhere near as, uh, nowhere near as hyperactive as our, our manic subjects. And we've recreated this in our dopamine transporter knockdown mice so that when they had their initial test, these animals were hyperactive. Upon repeated testing, however, these animals were no longer as hyperactive. So when they became acclimated to the testing environment, it was no longer novel, they weren't as hyperactive. And we actually see that in our patient population as well. What's really nice is that when we altered the chamber to make it more novel, we saw that our dopamine transporter knockdown mice, shown here in the, the white triangle, they actually increased the level of activity in the chamber. Those not within a novel environment, those in the circles, were still just less act, were still not as active. But an, or an introduction to novelty or to a low, low dose of GBR, which doesn't really activate the wild type mice, can reproduce a mania like profile in our animals. Consistent with what we see in uh, patients with euthymia, where if you put them into a very novel and very challenging environment, can actually um, precipitate a, a manic episode in our patients. Or if they uh, take amphetamines or other stimulants, it can precipitate a manic episode. And so we're recreating some of that profile in our animal models here. I mentioned that, of course, one of the key um, aspects to developing a, an animal model is predictive validity. And the, the treatments that are currently used, does it treat the the behavioral profile. Well, we treated our animals with uh, valproate over 28 days in chronic chow. Now, in, in preliminary studies, what we found is if we gave them chronic chow at 10 grams per kilogram, it produced uh, plasma levels around uh, 50 uh, micrograms per milliliter. Uh, higher doses at 20 produces much higher levels. And really, this is in, in the clinic, this is a therapeutic window that you're looking for. And if we gave them at 15 grams per kilogram, that's exactly what we saw. And so when we treated animals with 15 grams per kilogram, what we found is that our, our dopamine transporter knockdown mice actually had a lower level of activity with chronic valproate treatment. So you see this at the, in uh, regular chow, they're still hyperactive, but on uh, valproate chow, they become less active significantly so compared to those given the regular chow. Although in wild type mice, the valproate chow didn't have an effect by itself. So it's not simply just reducing the activity over all of the animals, it's having a selective effect of this model. What we found to be interesting and definitely what we perhaps would have predicted is that this uh, treatment didn't have an effect on the specific hole poking, the specific exploration, however, nor did it affect spatial D. 
So we seem to be having a treatment that's used in the clinic that's actually affecting the, uh, the degree of the hyperactivity of the animals without touching other aspects of their behavior. What's, in, what's uh, incredibly interesting is that we see this similar effect in our bipolar manic patients when we start giving them a valproate for long periods of time. We see a drop in effect size of their hyperactivity. We see no change in their uh, specific exploration or no change in their spatial D. And we published that in 2011. Um, what's the other interesting aspect with this is, is uh, particularly with the hole poking in this specific exploration, we've done correlations with the degree of hole poking and, uh, and gambling behavior in an hour gambling task, which if you come to this afternoon session, you'll hear more about. Um, but it, this hole poking seems to link most closely with cognitive behaviors and risk preference. And again, this treatment isn't acting on it. It's not treating what might be the core to helping the patients. Instead, it's just targeting the hyperactivity, which given the fact that the, the predominant model over the past uh, three decades has been amphetamine-induced hyperactivity, is perhaps the reason the field hasn't moved on. Now, I mentioned, obviously, the Iowa gambling task. Mark, Mark included this as a plug for my talk later on, so I'm just leaving it in there. Um, but if you come later on to the afternoon session uh, hosted by Stan Floresco, um, being in Vegas, thinking that gambling would be a good thing to talk about, um, you'll get to hear a lot more information about that. But so to summarize some of the dopamine transporter uh, knockdown findings so far, particularly in terms of the, the framework that I put it into, what we see is that the, in terms of the psychomotor acceleration, we see, certainly see hyperactivity in our animals. We see them in our animals that are consistent with that um, of our manic subjects. Uh, we see data that I, we're not showing here, but uh, we've seen that the animals actually have a hedonia-like response when they're tested in progressive ratio breakpoint study. And we're looking to develop a human version of that to confirm that in our manic subjects as well. Now, I'll be talking later on about the risk-related learning in our gambling task. Um, but just to mention, we also saw PPI deficits. But first and foremost, and we'd like to test all of these aspects, but now I'm going to start talking to you about some of the neurocognitive assessments, such as uh, the vigilance deficit that we see in patients. And we'll also discuss some of the inhibitory control deficits. Now, I'll give you an example of where uh, the work that we've done, we've taken a, a, an animal task and we've reverse translated it to create a human version to better inform our animal task. Again, this bi-directional influence of the clinical and the preclinical studies informing one another. But well, here's an example of where we took an anim a human task and we translated it into an animal test and went back again. Um, so it's key that, to this that even if it doesn't matter the direction we go as long as there is a bi-directional aspect to the research. So he, the continuous performance test is one of the gold standard tests of attention used in the clinic. It, I mean, the CPT is basically an umbrella term for a variety of different uh, continuous performance tests, but effectively they all follow the same basic construct. Basically, the subject has to attend to a visual field over a period of time. They have to respond whenever target stimuli appear, but inhibit from responding to non-target stimuli. So obviously this is uh, consistent with the real life, certainly deficient in patients with schizophrenia, as well as in other uh, uh, groups, especially in bipolar disorder. And it was actually identified by Matrix, as well as um, several other groups, as a key uh, cognitive test for attention in the clinic. So I'll give you an, an example. Here's an example of a, a Connor CPT, um, where the subject has to respond whenever a letter appears. But whenever an, uh, a non-target letter, that is the letter X, whenever that appears, they have to inhibit from responding. So as the letters appear on the screen, the subject is dutifully responding, but it's when the X appears that they have to inhibit from responding. So this both target and non-target responses gives you a much better idea of whether A, the subject is even attending to the task, and B, it gives you an idea of their inhibitory response control. And realistically speaking, that's a key component in bipolar disorder, especially in mania. If we can improve the impulse and inhibitory con response control, perhaps we can, we can um, better allow them to control their lives. So we generate measures of hit rate, false alarm rates, and deep prime um, uh, using this task. Now in the, in the rodent world, one of the most common tests of attention has been the five choice hero reaction time task. Now that is a, a test developed by Trevor Robbins in Cambridge in 1983, used throughout the world, and it's gotten a, a, it's a wonderful task where the animal is presented with five cues. Whenever a target stimulus appears, 
the animal just simply moves towards that target stimulus, makes a response, and if it does it correctly, it gets a reward. And from this task, we can, and it does it for a long period of time, and we can generate a whole bunch of measures for this task. Well, one thing that's key here is, though, that it doesn't have a non-target component to it. And even though it's a, it's, this task was originally based on a human version of a choice serial reaction time task, unlike the CPT, it doesn't have a non-target. The, the subject at no point in time has to inhibit from responding. And so to take it to that state, we try to introduce a new component to the five CSR task. And we've called it the five choice continuous performance test. Where certainly there's still go trials, they still have to respond when there's a, a single stimulus, but they have to also inhibit from responding to non-target stimuli. You obviously, using these same metrics, we can measure the hits and misses, false alarm, correct rejections, and use signal detection theory just as we do in humans to measure D prime and bias. D prime being our primary measure of vigilance and attention, and bias telling you how responsive the subject is. Obviously, if a subject just sits there and responds to everything, we know they're pretty liberal in their responding. If they don't uh, respond to everything and they don't respond to anything, we know they're fairly conservative. It gives us an idea of the response type. There's a lot more information that we can generate that you can't see in the 5 CSR. Just to quickly mention, we can differentiate between two different background strains. In terms of accuracy, that is if they respond a lit hole or the hole next to the lit hole, uh, which is one of the primary measures from the 5 CSR, our C57 mice and our DBA mice didn't differ from the two tasks, uh, from the two uh, in, the, in the, this measure. But in terms of D prime, their ability to respond to target or inhibit from non-target responding, we see differences in the behavior. Now these mice are very different. They have lower alpha-7 nicotine receptor expression, but they also have many other differences. But importantly, this was the first piece of work that we showed that this task gives us an opportunity to measure something fundamentally different. Uh, as another example, we know that scopolamine can impair attention in the task, like it impairs attention in the CPT in humans. And the fact that we can co-administer nicotine with scopolamine to attenuate that deficit in the task. And we published this recently in, in 2013. We've also done a, an awful lot more work in terms of validating this task through, with many different uh, tests, whether it be a parietal lesion impairs performance in the task, not in the 5 CSR. Yeah, the parietal cortex is vitally important for human CPTs. When we've also worked with collaborators all around the world to try and develop, uh, help them set up the 5 choice CPT, and it's now been published on more than 15 different times, and, uh, and that number is increasing. Now, one of the great opportunities we've had to be in San Diego, and I've shown you already in the Department of Psychiatry, we work closely with clinicians. Um, well, in Lisa Eiler, after I gave a talk on the five choice CPT, Lisa Eiler, who works with bipolar patients as a clinician that does fMRI testing, came to me and said, well, what if we created a human version of that task? I hadn't thought of it up until that point, surprisingly enough, but of course we were all for it. And so we did the full reverse translation again. So we went from human CPT to animal and then back to humans. We used e prime 2 and a modified joystick uh, in order to measure attentional functioning in the same way that we do in animals. Incidentally, we used an arcade joystick because our patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia can get a little rough. Um, but they do like the joystick. They think it's a fun game, apparently. So it's worked out pretty well for us. Using this joystick, obviously, we can present to them a very similar paradigm where if there's a single light stimulus, they should respond in that direction. If there's five, uh, in whatever direction it appears. But if five stimuli appear, they should inhibit from responding. And we have this task set up outside the scanner as well as inside an fMRI scanner. Now, just to show the clinical relevance of the task, We've, got, we've tested patients with schizophrenia, and we've published on this already, showing that patients with schizophrenia, and these are chronically ill patients, not acutely ill though, that uh, have deficits in the task driven by a lower hit rate, an increased uh, false alarm rate, and a vigilance, so an overall vigilance deficit in the task. So this task that we've translated back and forth is not only available for use in animals, but we, it's also uh, showing clinical relevance to uh, deficits that we know we should see in patients. But more importantly, with Lisa Eiler's work, we can actually combine it with fMRI analysis. And this in, uh, work that we published in NeuroImage in uh, 2012 um, with Ben McKenna and Lisa Eiler, we've identified uh, specific brain regions that are important for responding to individual targets as well as how uh, brain regions are important for 
responses to non-targets, that is your false alarms, your response disinhibition. So in the, in the targets, this is just a representative subject. You can see a lot of motor uh, activation. We also see parietal activation, frontal lobe activation. In terms of when a non-target stimulus appears, suddenly that motor activation is decreased, is depressed, uh, but you see activation of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, as well as activation of the parietal lobe as well. And the nice thing is, of course, that gives us, uh, when we did the parietal lesions in mice, and it affected performance in both the target and non-target aspect of performing the task, Obviously, the parietal cortex is important in both aspects as well in humans, providing the opportunity to do this construct validity of this five-choice CPT. Now, interestingly, in, our, in patients with bipolar disorder, what we found is that um, there is a decrease in the right middle uh, frontal gyral activation during this non-target trial. So we need this. So clearly that activation was important for inhibiting response to non-target trials. In our bipolar patients, we see, this is preliminary data, that's, um, and what we see is our increase in uh, false alarm responses, that is response to inhibition in our bipolar subjects, and that is correlated with the degree reduced activation in this frontal region. So not only do we get to do this construct validity of going back and forth from animals to human, but by using this in patients, it's giving us the chance to identify novel targets for which we can then assess in animals to dis dissect the neural mechanisms within that Brazier region that might contribute to this increased false alarm responding. So, of course, if we've got this set up in uh, mice, and, mice and in humans, so how would our animals respond in this task? in our dopamine transporter knockdown mice that we used and we identified from doing a very simple paradigm. They were showing a particular pattern in the behavioral pattern monitor. And does this translate to other um, aspects? I already mentioned about uh, hedonia-like progressive racial breakpoint. They've got PPI deficits. And sure enough, when we tested them in the five-choice CPT, we saw an increase in the number of emissions so that misses to targets. Uh, more importantly, we saw an increase in the, the level of false alarms and the percentage of false alarms. So like the bipolar patients, they're responding more often to the non-target stimuli that they should inhibit from responding to. In terms of um, their SI, that is their vigilance measure, again, they have a significant deficit in the task compared to that of their wild-type mice. And in fact, I didn't have the data in here because this was Mark's talk. Um, but we've tested manic patients in this task and that we see significant deficits of performance in the task in mania patients. Of interesting, of what they note, I have to say, uh, as a plug to the five choice CPT, when these animals were trained in the five CSR task, however, they actually had better performance in the task. They had a lower level of percentage emissions. And that's realistically speaking because the animals are extremely responsive. They're hyper-responsive in most things that we do. We saw the increased object interaction or the hole poking. And when they were just needing to respond to a target stimulus only in a task, they were hyper-responsive and did it really well. But it's when you include the non-target responses that requires them to also inhibit from responding that it requires the greater cognitive control. That's when we saw deficits in the, the animals. Um, of course, one of the key reasons for doing some of this work is to move towards trying to identify treatments. This is an example that um, we've used where you can actually give uh, healthy humans nicotine skin patches and it actually improves their performance on a CPT. It primarily improves performance, however, by reducing the number of emission errors that they're, they're likely to make. So that, this is the number of errors of emission. So it was lower with a nicotine skin patch. And correspondingly, their deep prime measure, their attentional measure, was significantly improved in healthy subjects. They were simply given a seven milligram uh, patch of nicotine. And this similar improvement is also seen in patients with schizophrenia, um, and although not as much has been done in bipolar disorder. So we began to, we began to uh, some studies in bipolar disorder, looking at subjects, first of all, that smoke versus those that don't smoke. The actual prevalence of smoking in bipolar disorder is just as high as that in schizophrenia. I'm sure you've heard how high it is in schizophrenia. It's about 70% of the population smoke. Um, one of the reasons, of course, we think in schizophrenia is that perhaps they're self-medicating. Not too much has been talked about whether they're self-medicating in bipolar disorder, but why wouldn't that be the theory as well? Now, when we looked at patients outside of the scanner that are uh, performing this five-choice CPT, we see that 
um, those non-smokers compared to the healthy subjects are, have significantly worse performance and they're, they're omitting more often than not compared to the, the healthy subjects. When we look at patients that had just smoked before uh, doing the test, however, we didn't have license to give them nicotine to healthy subjects. We're hoping to build up to that. But what we found is that the, uh, the subjects, the green circle here, the bipolar disorder smokers, we saw that they actually have improved performance in the task compared to that of those that didn't smoke. Now, when we looked at um, just uh, as these, the fMRI results of these patients in the scanner doing uh, a similar type task, what we see is that there's a significantly reduced activation in the, the bipolar patients that smoke uh, that's even lower than in those that don't smoke. So that we can begin to combine some of these studies to try and identify um, biomarkers of whether the drug is, if we end up developing a treatment that's nicotine based, perhaps we can you know, develop biomarkers for, how, for whether that is actually acting um, in the specific brain region of interest. And of course, I mentioned that the, the knocked out animals have higher percentage emissions and have a lower vigilance index. Well, when we treated them with chronic nicotine, because obviously we tried to recreate the, the chronic nicotine use in the bipolar patients, we then performed a challenge on these animals that didn't really affect the performance of the wild types in white, but significantly dropped the level of performance in the knocked out animals. When they were given nicotine for 28 days, you see that the wild type animals were actually improved in the challenge but the knockdown animals were improved compared to those that didn't get, the the, the, the didn't get nicotine, um, although they didn't show the same significant improvement. These data to us suggest that it's not necessarily that nicotine is affecting something that's fundamentally wrong in, uh, in these animals. Nicotine is just having a, exerting a, a general beneficial effect on performance in the task. But certainly these data begin to match up with what we see in our human subjects that smoke that nicotine may actually be a target for general cognition enhancement. So ultimately what we've shown is that the, the five choice CPT actually has a, a large degree of construct validity for human CPTs. We see uh, reaction time effects that are dependent upon attentional loads. Uh, we see a vigilance decrement, and we've seen it in numerous cohorts so far. Uh, the sensitivity of the D' prime measure to vigilance decrement is an important aspect for attentional functioning. You don't often see in the 5 CSR, in fact, only been one publication, but we see it every time in the 5 choice CPT. Um, it differentiates, uh, we see differences on the neural mechanism underlying uh, false alarms and another impulsivity measure in the 5 CSR, that is the premature responses. And um, obviously we see a, a, a fair degree of predictive validity for human CPT. Uh, for the human five choice CPT. We've got similar effects of uh, uh, nicotine in mice as in humans. And we've actually shown the vigilance decrement that's greater in patients. Uh, the parietal cortical activation, one thing that's not mentioned here, which I've gone through, is that uh, we've also done sleep deprivation in humans and in animals, and we saw significant effects on performance in the same measures. 36 hours of sleep deprivation significantly impairs performance of both mice and humans in this task. Um, so the, the work that we're doing to tie together the performance of both humans and animals and moving forward to understand the neural mechanisms underlying deficits in the clinical population, as well as identifying targets for treatment and then testing those treatments is really work that's going hand in hand. So as, uh, to leave you with a few general conclusions before we move on to questions, um, it's obviously incredibly difficult to fully model any psychiatric disorder. There's a reason schizophrenia is known as the schizophrenia. Bipolar disorder is by no means ubiquitous. Um, there, the variety of behavioral abnormalities is extreme, but if we can take each of these processes piecemeal, we can try to recreate that uh, as in an animal model. We can also work to test whether the neural mechanism is important for that particular domain of function, whether it be attentional functioning, hyperactivity, or moving further afield. Obviously, one of the major benefits of this, and this can't be stressed highly enough, is that if you're going to measure a particular cognitive function or a particular behavior, um, rather than asking whether the animals are just a general, generally don't appear as good, or the, the human doesn't quite feel as good, and this is important for both human and animal studies is that if you measure a specific construct, you're more likely to be measuring something that's tied to the specific biological substrates that drive that behavior. 
And obviously, when it comes to developing treatments, that is going to be a key aspect in the future. And obviously, the validation of animal models I've emphasized throughout this is, is entirely dependent upon the quality of evidence that we receive from our clinician colleagues. It's not enough to allow clinicians to go and do the work and then hopefully we can try to recreate what uh, auditory hallucinations might mean in animals. It's important to work hand in hand with our clinical colleagues to develop these quantitative measurements in, in our animals. And it's work that's being done more and more these days and it's impressive to see. So uh, to um, summarize the translational evidence, people talk about translation, people talk about what's needed. This task might measure this in animals, because it's an important thing to measure in humans. Let's move away from that and say that this task measures the same thing in animals as it does in humans. There are aspects and there are examples I've given you here, but uh, Andre Daravakian spoke earlier on at the Nicotine Symposium and he gave other, other examples of key um, ways you can measure the same behavior in humans as you can measure in animals that gives you the same uh, output. And that's really the way the field needs to move forward in order to develop treatments that are by fact uh, for uh, psychiatric disorders that are based upon the behavioral abnormalities that they exhibit. And so that just leaves me to list many of the people that have been involved in all of this. And obviously this is Mark's lab and is a, a massive uh, list of people that have been important for every aspect of this work, as well as the work that Mark has done over the years as well. Um, from grad students to key staff, uh, faculty and postdocs. One of the things I have to say about Mark in particular, is that he has a wonderful mentor. He's been a wonderful mentor to me in the past. He's been a wonderful mentor to many people that have now gone on to, to have independent research careers of their own, associate professors across, across the country, as well as around the world, as well as now chairs of departments of psychiatry in, in, in key institutions. And uh, it's a real shame he couldn't be here to, today to talk to you about some of this work, but I am very proud to show you the work that's been done. The faculty and staff and students are shown here and they all find it just as much a pleasure to work with Mark as I do. Thank you for your time.